Well, welcome to Sunday School on the Go from the First Baptist Church in Tallahassee. I'm Jim Glass, one of the teachers in the Pairs and Spares class. And on this first Sunday in April, with Easter just three weeks away, it's my privilege to lead you through a brief overview of the first of the Apostle Paul's two letters to the followers of Christ in the ancient city of Thessalonica. Last week, we completed the first half of his first letter to the believers at the church in Thessalonica, where he celebrated their faith, love, and hope. In the second half of this letter, Paul will provide some very practical advice about how to pursue the personal purity and brotherly love he had prayed for, so that they and we can be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all His holy ones. Chapter 4 is made up of two sections. The first deals with practical instructions for life in general, and the second deals with instructions for those who are grieving over the loss of believing friends or family members. Our focal text today takes us to the first 12 verses of chapter 4, where Paul gives some very specific commands to these followers of the Lord Jesus Christ who have so wonderfully demonstrated their work produced by faith, their labor prompted by love, and their endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. In the two verses, in the first two verses of this chapter, Paul encourages them to increase and abound in the Christian virtues he's already seen in their lives. He then provides them with some very explicit instructions related to their continuing sanctification in verses 3 through 8, and finally offers guidance about their dealings with other people, particularly those within the body of Christ there in Thessalonica in verses 9 through 12. Now, throughout this letter so far, we've seen how generously Paul has lifted his praise to God and celebrated the Thessalonian believers' outworking of the gospel in their lives. Their imitation of the Lord and Paul, their joyful endurance through persecution, their examples to others in Macedonia and Achaia, their turning from the gods of the Greeks worshipped to the one living and true God, and how eagerly they looked forward to the return of the Lord Jesus. All these things and more showed how responsive they had been to the gospel proclaimed to them as well as the powerful working of the Holy Spirit within their lives. Now, you'll remember that Paul wrote this letter just after Timothy returned from Thessalonica with the wonderful news of their faithfulness and steadfastness, as well as their love for Paul. He closed the previous chapter with a prayer for their growth in love and holiness as they awaited the Lord's soon return. Now, we know, as James tells us in the last chapter of his letter, that the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. But our prayers of intercession for others can't bring about the result we desire without the cooperation of those for whom we pray. So Paul, who has prayed for the Lord on their behalf, now makes a direct appeal to the Thessalonians themselves to walk as they had been taught by him. This, of course, is exactly what Jesus told us to do when he said, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things I have commanded you. As you would expect, Paul carefully followed this divine command. He had made disciples in Thessalonica, and now he had begun to teach them how to walk and to please God. So his first words of encouragement are to keep on doing the things they've been doing. Verse 1, Finally then, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you received from us instruction as to how you ought to walk and please God just as you actually do walk, that you excel still more. For you know what commandments we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. Although we're only in the middle of this letter, Paul begins this section with the word, finally. The New International Version gives us a better idea of what he intended as it translates the word as, as for other matters, while the King James Version reads, furthermore. Now, Paul's concluded his words of thanksgiving and celebration and is now moving on to some very practical matters for the believers there. He frames these practical matters with two verbs. We request and exhort. What he's about to tell them 
is extremely important. He could have said, I command you with his authority as an apostle, but that's not Paul's way with these believers whom he loved so much and who loved him so very much. He doesn't need to be forceful with them, but because of the issues involved, he does need to be firm. So he begins with asking them, to take to heart what he's about to say, then follows with a much stronger word that signifies earnest exhortation. And these words are not his words. He appeals to the name and authority of the Lord Jesus, the one who delivers us from the wrath to come, as Paul wrote in the closing verse of the first chapter. How would the Lord Jesus deliver them from the wrath to come? By following Paul's requests and exhortations that he offers here in the closing words in this letter, beginning in chapter 4. His instructions concern how they ought to walk. Now, life is often spoken of as a journey, walking one step at a time, and we find this in Paul's letters and in literature in general. And they ought to walk and please God, not just walk in such a way that what they do and where they go and what they say would please God, but that they ought to walk in such a way that their intentions, as well as the result of their intentions, please God. The way we conduct ourselves in public and in private will either be pleasing or displeasing to the Lord. And the person who is eagerly anticipating the return of the Lord Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come, will certainly set his or her heart on doing what is pleasing to the Lord in all things. Once again, The foundation for Paul's instructions is not his own set of rules that he made up. The commands, he says, were given to them by the authority of the Lord Jesus. Paul had only been with them for a few short weeks before he and his fellow workers were were whisked away. But even in that brief time, they must have received quite a thorough course of instruction in the life, ministry, and teachings of our Lord Jesus. He had certainly used Jesus' life as the basis for his moral instruction for them. Our Lord's life still remains as the standard of our lives today. And as one commentator writes, the mind of Christ is the norm for the Christian conscience. The words of Jesus have still their old authority. They still search out our hearts and show us all things that ever we did and their moral worth or worthlessness. They still open to us gates of righteousness, and call on us to enter in and subdue new territories to God. The individual who is most advanced in the life which pleases God and whose conscience is most nearly identical with the mind of Christ will be the first to confess his or her need of and his or her constant dependence upon the word and example of the Lord Jesus. In verse 3, Paul begins his request and exhortation in the Lord Jesus as he lays out three very detailed and specific instructions. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. That is, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion, like the Gentiles who do not know God, and that no man transgress and defraud his brother, in the matter, because the Lord is the avenger in all these things, just as we also told you before and solemnly warned you. For those whom God had chosen, chapter 1, verse 4, who had welcomed the gospel with a joy given by the Holy Spirit, verse 6, who had become a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia, verse 7, those who wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath, verse 10, and those who are Paul's glory and his joy, chapter 2, verse 20. God had a very specific plan and purpose. For all those reasons and more, God's will for them and for us is that they and we would continue in the process of sanctification when they first entrusted their lives to Christ. For those who wonder about what God's will is for their lives, well, here's the answer. Our sanctification. That we keep on pursuing righteousness and holiness, even as God is holy. Sanctification is the act or process of making something holy, setting it apart for God's use. 
It's an ongoing, continuous process, as the writer of the letter to the Hebrews reminds us in chapter 12, verse 14, when he writes, Make every effort to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. It's a fulfillment of God's call to holiness from Leviticus chapter 11, verse 44, all the way through Scripture to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15, where the Lord says, Be holy, for I am holy. Paul's call to sanctification doesn't mean that God intended to make them holy, but that, com that command was that we should be holy. Now, while it's certainly true that God's intention was that they and we should be holy and that He would use every means available to accomplish this purpose, that's not what we find here. The words here tell us that God requires holiness from those He has chosen and who has responded to His call to faith. We have to make the effort to make it happen. Like Paul, we have responsibility, a duty, a holy obligation to continuously pursue purity of life, both in the negative aspect of ceasing to do evil as well as the positive aspect of doing well, cultivating the positive principles of holiness in our souls. Even as he wrote to the believers in Philippi in chapter 3, verse 13, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. In the second half of verse 3, Paul begins to list the specific areas of their lives that needed to be sanctified or made holy, turned completely over to the Lord. Both those things they needed to turn away from as well as those things they needed to turn towards. The first thing on his list is that they must abstain from sexual immorality. There may, may be no more powerful and persistently tempting sin than those that deal with our sexuality. Although God created Adam and Eve and provided such a perfect relationship between them and with God that the second chapter of the book of Genesis ends with the words, the man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. But everything changed when sin entered the world. The good that they had been created for was horribly corrupted. And as a result, sin would cause each to see others as objects to be used to fulfill their own purposes and desires rather than individuals created in the image and likeness of God for His honor and glory. Paul named the abuse of our sexuality as one of the primary reasons why, Romans chapter 1, verse 18, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. The literature and the art of that day give us a clear idea of how widespread sexual immorality was. And things haven't changed much in 2,000 years. Sexual relations outside of marriage were widespread in the Greek and Roman world of that day and even promoted by some pagan religions that included sex with male and female prostitutes as part of their religious rituals. The temptations of sexual sin that assailed these early believers were terribly strong. And all of Paul's letters contain some urgent warning to avoid sexual immorality. Against the sex-crazed and sex-saturated culture of his day and ours, Paul reminded them, and he reminds us, that our physical bodies belong to God. Paul asked the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 15, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ Himself? Verse 19. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You're not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. As the Thessalonians turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, chapter 1, verse 9, avoiding this sin so prevalent in society, they would demonstrate their devotion to the living and true God and turn from the idol of sexual immorality. Negatively, we are to abstain from and avoid sexual immorality in all its forms. 
positively, each of us must know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. Or, as the New International Version reads, learn to control our own bodies in a way that is holy and honorable. To possess yourself means to maintain self-control. What you do, what you say, how you feel, beginning with how you think. Paul used the word vessel to remind us that like an earthen vessel made of clay, our bodies are frail and feeble. But, as he writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we bear a precious treasure in these earthen body of ours. He says, we always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. As a result, we should honor our physical bodies and employ our bodies for purposes that honor God and His goal for creating us to begin with. Paul told the Romans in chapter 6, verse 19, just as you used to offer the parts of your body in slavery to impurity and ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer them in slavery to righteousness, leading to holiness. He returns to a negative command in verse 5 and provides a comparison. Possess your own vessel, not in lustful passion, like the Gentiles who do not know God. Again, Paul warns them of the prevalence of sexual immorality in that day. The Gentiles who did not know God were easily carried away by the temptation to fall victim to the desires of the flesh, as if they were the passive instruments of sin that they couldn't control and didn't have the desire to control either. As Paul wrote in the first chapter of his letter to the Romans, unbelievers first denied their maker and then degraded themselves, not knowing or caring about what God had originally intended for them. At the other extreme were the believers in Thessalonica who had come to know God through Paul's proclamation of the gospel, the convicting and redeeming power of the Holy Spirit, and their faith, so that their bodies had been redeemed from vice and dishonor to virtue and honor, and their souls now had a clean vessel in which to live, a vessel devoted for God and His holy purposes. In verse 6, Paul gives the third command for pursuing sanctification in their lives, that no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter. Or, as newer translations have it, that in this matter no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. The word translated defraud or wrong literally means to make to go over, as over a wall or a boundary. So to go beyond a wall of duty or righteousness is to transgress or cheat. Paul uses both of these words to warn them against crossing established boundaries to take advantage of someone else in the relation to the matter he's been discussing in these verses, that of sexual immorality. Practically speaking, he's telling them not to engage in sexual relations beyond the bounds of marriage that God has established. While Paul's instructions clearly include this and every form of sexual immorality, the words are general enough to include a prohibition against all kinds of fraud, overreaching, or covetousness, and any attempt to deprive another believer of his or her rights, whether it be property rights, rights as a husband or a wife, or rights in any other respect. It's a general command not to defraud or take advantage of another, that applies, first of all, to sexual relations within the members of the body of Christ. This aspect of sanctification is so vitally important that Paul adds an unequivocal reminder at the end of verse 6. The Lord is the avenger in all these things, just as we also told you before and solemnly warned you. We've already pointed out to, to how God views sexual sin in society in the opening chapter of Paul's letter to the followers of Christ in Rome. If that same sin were to find expression within the body of Christ, the implications would be so much more destructive as distrust and deceit would horribly infect the family of God and destroy the natural bonds of Christian fellowship. So Paul reminds them that we also told you before and solemnly warned you. There's no doubt 
that Paul understood the very real danger and recognized the need to call the believers there to sanctification in every aspect of their sexuality. Paul's warning to the believers in Galatia reflected this widespread indulgence in sexual sin that genuine followers of Christ must studiously avoid. In chapter 4, verse 17 of Galatians, he writes, I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. Unfortunately, once again, some things never change, and Paul's words must be heard and heeded today. And then to underscore once again the critical importance of recognizing and respecting the boundaries of sexual thoughts and relations and marriage in Thessalonica, Paul adds in verse 7, God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. The word translated impurity or uncleanness is the same word for filth, so that in a moral sense it refers to personal pollution or depravity, the very opposite of holiness. In his second letter to the believers in Corinth, Paul expressed his deep concern that they had not heeded his previous warning. In chapter 12, verse 21, he says, I'm afraid that when I come again, my God will humble, humble me before you, and I will be grieved over many who have sinned earlier and have not repented of their impurity, sexual sin, and debauchery in which they have indulged. To the followers of Christ in Colossae, he provided a very forceful command in chapter 3, verse 5 of his letter to them, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, he says, the wrath of God is coming. Paul tells the Thessalonians, God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. God's call is His claim on our lives and the starting point for our new life in Christ. It's a calling in holiness that was made possible by the amazing and astonishing plan of God, the incarnation of the Son of God, God coming in the form of one of us in the person of Jesus, His holy life upon the earth, His victory over every temptation, the sanctification He made possible by His own sinless experience, His agony and His death on the cross where He paid the penalty in full for all our sins from our childhood, youth, and adulthood, complete with sin's false sense of power, its tendency towards rebellion and pride, and its rejection of God's love and His righteous rule over our lives, and our Lord's glorious resurrection and ascension, Jesus had to endure all of this before we could be called in order that we might be called and respond to His call. This leads one commentator to ask, can anyone imagine that the vices of ungodliness, lust, or covetousness are compatible with a calling like this? Are they not excluded by the very idea of it? It is God who has called us, and He has called us in Christ Jesus, and therefore called us to be saints. Flee, therefore, everything that is unholy and, clean, and unclean. All the motives and goals that inspire and govern our lives are contained in this call that's an answer to the prayer Paul prayed at the close of chapter 3. May He strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus Christ comes with all His holy ones. From then on, they were to live a life worthy of the calling they had received. Impurity of any kind had then and has now absolutely no place in the life of a genuine follower of Jesus Christ. In verse 8, Paul follows us up with a reminder and a stern warning. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, 
but God who gives His Holy Spirit to you. Older translations carry even more weight when they translate the word disregards as despises. The word means to invalidate or to make null and void. In reality, if, God's call, if God calls us, as He called the Thessalonians, to a holy life and shows us how to live that life and gives us clear instructions about how to live that life, and we reject it, we are really rejecting and disobeying God Himself. Now, it's possible that Paul was addressing the claims of those who said that he's just making these things up to control people and keep them in line. But he assures them that although the words came from his mouth, they originated in the very heart of God, having been commanded by God from the very beginning. Just as it had been God who was the originator of the gospel and who called them into his kingdom and glory as they turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, as he's told us already, it was God and not Paul who was the authority for these instructions, beginning with verse 3. It is God's will that you should be sanctified. In the Old Testament, as well as the New, we read of sins of ignorance, but ignorance is no excuse for these sins that he speaks of here. To commit this sin is to sin against what everyone knows to be sin and from the beginning has been known to be wrong. It's to be guilty of the deliberate, willful, high-handed contempt of God. So Paul doesn't pull any punches. He doesn't sugarcoat it or try to make it something it's not. Behind all Paul's warnings and encouragement to be holy, is God's inevitable vengeance. And those who reject these warnings don't reject a man like Paul. They reject God himself. All this is reinforced again by what Paul says at the end of verse 8, reminding them that it is God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Already we've seen Paul tell of the work of the Holy Spirit in the first chapter where he reminded them about their own conversion. Verse 5, the gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. Soon after, their conversion experience was followed by persecution. And Paul reminds them in verse 6 that in spite of severe suffering, they welcomed the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. This gift of the Holy Spirit that Paul speaks of here in chapter 4 is the fulfillment of what Jesus promised to his disciples. As John records for us in his gospel, chapter 14, I will ask the Father, Jesus said, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. Through this indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we know the love of God and are conscious of being children of God and heirs of eternal life, as Paul would later write in Romans chapter 5, verse 5, and chapter 8, verses 14 through 17, Galatians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, and Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. In fact, we could say that the whole grace of the gospel is summed up by Paul in the promise of the Spirit received through faith as he writes in his letter to the Galatians, chapter 3, verse 14. As a result, any failure to respond to God's call to holiness and sanctification is an insult and an offense to the Holy Spirit who dwells within every believer. But because the Holy Spirit dwells within us, we know that God is not against us, but He is for us. He is the Holy One and an avenger at all these things, but He is also the God of our salvation, our deliverer from all these temptations who gives His Holy Spirit to us. These, those, these words put in the strongest light God's interest in us and in our sanctification. It's our sanctification that He desires as we give more and more of ourselves to Him. He calls us to this sanctification, and He enables this sanctification and empowers us to pursue this sanctification as we allow the Holy Spirit abiding in us to transform us more closely into the image of Jesus. In verse 9, Paul changes the subject to address an aspect of the Christian life 
that they've been very successful with, that labor of love that is one of the three themes of this letter. Here's what he writes beginning in verse 9. Now, as to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. For indeed, you do practice it toward all the brethren who are in Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, to excel still more and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and to tend to your own business and work with your hands just as we commanded you so that you will behave properly toward outsiders and not be in any need. This is truly a powerful testimony of their reception of the gospel and their sanctification that they love their brothers and sisters in Christ. As our Lord prepared for his arrest and crucifixion, he told his disciples in John chapter 13, verse 34, A new commandment I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Paul tells them that nobody needed to tell them how to love one another because they had been taught by God himself. This single word in the Greek that we have translated have been taught by God doesn't appear anywhere else in our New Testaments and means that they had received some direct instructions from God. What this immediate inspiration was, we don't really know. But it was surely the result of what he wrote back in verse 5 of the first chapter that our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. Part of the power and the conviction of the Holy Spirit included the obvious result that they love their brothers and sisters in Christ just as God has loved them. John recognized this as a distinguishing characteristic of Christians when he wrote in 1 John chapter 3, verse 14, We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. In being born again, believers have a new nature with new instincts, a new law for life, and a new motivation to love others, even as we have been loved by God. Before Christ comes into our lives, we're at war with everyone out to get everything we can because we're the center of our universe. But when we entrust our lives to Christ, that warfare comes to an end because we all equally become children of God. And as John writes in 1 John chapter 4, beginning in verse 7, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and His love is made complete in us. The Thessalonians were obeying this new commandment and giving evidence of the genuineness of their conversion through their love for each other something that no one had to teach them, but just came to them naturally as an essential characteristic of having been saved. Even though they didn't need any special instructions on this point, there was still room for advancement, an increase in their love for one another. And even though Paul knew possibly from Timothy or others that they loved all their brothers and sisters in Christ and all of Macedonia, he still urged them to excel in their love even more. And there's plenty of room for brotherly love to excel and increase among believers today throughout the church of God. Recognizing their love for one another and the opportunity they had now to increase that love, Paul follows this with a second word of instruction in verse 11. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and attend to your own business and work with your hands just as we commanded you. Now, this might seem to be a strange word from the man who, everywhere he went, didn't live a quiet life, but stirred up trouble, causing pe people in Thessalonica, for example, to riot and go to the city officials and tell them, these men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here. When Paul was brought before Felix, the governor of Judea, a lawyer hired by Ananias, the high priest in Jerusalem, opened his testimony against Paul by saying, 
we have found this man to be a troublemaker, stirring up riots among the Jews all over the world. But now, Paul is telling the believers in Thessalonica to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. One commentator suggests that the love of personal distinction was an act of influence and potent for mischief in Greek city life. It's possible, he says, that the Thessalonians were touched with it and betrayed symptoms of the restless and aggressive spirit that afterwards gave the apostles so much trouble in Corinth. While that, that may well have been true, it's certainly the case that before they came to Christ, they were concerned about only what would help them succeed in life, using whatever means possible to get by as best they could and to get ahead in the process. Now, having found peace with God and all their needs met through His glorious riches by Christ Jesus, they didn't have to fight to get ahead. They could simply rest in God's amazing grace and provision with an inward tranquility saturated with God's love. Not only were they to lead a quiet life, they were also to attend to their own business, to focus on their own concerns and not meddle in the lives of others. Those who worry about what other people are doing all too often neglect what they should be doing themselves, their own duties and responsibilities. This was not to be a part of the lives of the believers in Thessalonica, but it probably was, and he'll have more to say about that in his second letter to them. Lead a quiet life, mind your own business, and third, work with your hands. Paul restored the dignity of manual labor that had been largely looked down on and disparaged by the Greeks of that day and that Paul himself modeled as a tent maker himself. Apparently, most of the believers there were members of the working class, and some of them needed this instruction. The dignity of our work doesn't depend on what we do, but on the attitude we take towards the work we do. Dr. Martin Luther King once told a group of students at a high school in Philadelphia, if it falls your lot to be a street sweeper, sweep streets like Michelangelo painted pictures. Sweep streets like Beethoven composed music. Sweep streets like Shakespeare wrote poetry. Sweep streets so well that all the hosts of heaven and earth will have to pause and say, here lived a great street sweeper who swept his job well. Paul would later tell the followers of Christ in Colossae in chapter 3 of his letter to them, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It's the Lord Christ you are serving. With these basic instructions clearly laid before them, Paul now provides the reason for their continued sanctification. Their growth and their love for other believers, leading a quiet life, minding their own business, and working with their hands in verse 12. He says, so that you will behave properly toward outsiders and not be in any need. Followers of Christ are always being watched by the world to see if we'll practice what we preach. By this, Jesus said, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. In a thriving commercial port city like Thessalonica, failing to live as Christ taught them to live would bring great discredit on this new people of God that, that God was making for Himself. The church of all ages should share the same image as its founder, and every Christian should bear that same image as well. Any behavior or attitude that is inconsistent with the life of Christ discredits the Lord Himself. And lost people see this, and when they do, they often question whether this thing called Christianity is for real. One of our own church principles here at First Baptist Tallahassee is the principle of every member ministry, and it reflects this, beginning with, it is every member's responsibility to promote the mission, protect the reputation, and ensure the success of the church. Not only did Paul provide the instructions so that the believers in Thessalonica would behave properly toward those outside the church, but also so that there would not be any in need. As they loved one another, 
They would see the needs of others and seek to meet those needs as the Lord provided for their own needs. This was a visible characteristic of the church from the very beginning, where we read in Acts chapter 2, verse 44, all the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. As the believers in Thessalonica expressed their love for one another in this very practical way, avoiding the specific sins he warns them about in our focal text, they would enable others to lead a quiet life and attend to their own business and work with their own hands, teaching others to fish instead of making them dependent on them for fish. While it was important then, as it is now, to care for the poor, we care for them best when we equip and enable them to succeed on their own, allowing them in turn to help others. Such are the very practical, very pertinent words for the believers in first, Thessal first century Thessalonica as well as 21st century America and the world. Pursue holiness in every aspect of your life, beginning with your thoughts and the most intimate desires of your heart. Abound in your love for the members of the family of God and let your life radiate with the purity and love of God so that others would be drawn to Him. This is how we ought to walk and please God. Well, thank you for being a part of our survey of Paul's first letter to these amazing disciples of Christ in Thessalonica, whose lives radiated with faith, love, and hope as they lived in eager anticipation of the soon return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Next week on Palm Sunday, we turn to the second half of chapter 4 of Paul's first letter to the believers in Thessalonica, where we'll hear how he encouraged them in their own hope of the resurrection as they awaited the soon return of the resurrection of the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. As always, as it's still a good thing to do, keep calm, trust the Lord, and wash your hands. God bless you, and Happy Easter.